James, and we have been for some time. So let's go back to James. James chapter 3 is where we are today. James chapter 3. I actually want to start by reading two things. Uh, one from the book of Proverbs, and then one from the Psalms will be our opening prayer this morning. But Proverbs chapter uh, 13 verse 3 says that whoever guards the, his mouth preserves his life, and he who opens wide his lips uh, comes to ruin. This is a tough one for me because I talk a lot. Uh, maybe some of you are the same. Uh, maybe some of you are naturally quiet, and you, maybe we, you appear wise because of your silence. Uh, maybe you are, maybe you aren't wise. I don't know. You just, we don't know any different. You know how dumb I am because I talk all the time. Uh, but we're going to talk a lot about speech, and remember that the book of James, some people read the book of James as a, as a real practical instruction manual. Here's the things you need to do to be a really good Christian. I read it another way, um, and this is the way I'm going to continue to preach it. Um, I think there is good advice here, but most of the book of James is actually a warning. It's, it's saying, look at your life. And let, let the things that we're going to talk about, these really practical things, be an indicator of the condition of your heart. We talked about the fruit and the root, the fruit of your life. What is the fruit of your life, and what's the condition of your heart? And frankly, frankly, this one today hurts a little. When we talk about our speech, uh, we come to realize that perhaps we weren't quite as good as we thought we were. And so this, is, uh, this comes from... Kind of a humbling and a hard place for me as I wrestle through this, and especially even the first few verses uh, I need to recognize in James chapter 3, aimed at me first, and so I just want you to know that this is not an easy thing for me to preach as well. This will be our prayer. Let's go to the book of Psalms if you could. Keep your finger in James. And I want to read Psalm 141. Psalm got lots of time. If you can't find Psalm 141, now's your, now's your chance. Got her? Yeah? All right. So you can ignore everything I said before. All right. Psalm 141, in verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. <clears throat> Father, guard me from saying things that are false and things that are not constructive to us this morning. I thank you, Lord, that I speak no wrong thing if I speak your word. And I would just pray, Father, that you would so fill me with your spirit that what would come out also is, is words from your spirit this morning. Lord, uh, forgive me because I know this is a, an area that I struggle with. My words, my joking, my the things that I say in frustration. Uh, Lord, just uh, forgive me for that. I recognize, Father, that... Uh, in these words is instruction, but it's also, uh, I think, you trying to put the mirror up to our face uh, so that we would see who we are and, and areas where we need to shore up. So I just pray for your help this morning. For all of us, would you show us the condition of our heart, even through what we say in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 3 uh, is going to begin with teachers. Uh, how many of you looked in a mirror this morning? before you came. I know some of you, it's obvious you didn't, but <laughs> some, most of you did, right? You looked in the mirror and what happened? What'd you do? Ah! ah! <laughs> you just went back to bed. There was just no hope, so I went back to bed. No, okay. You likely corrected the certain things that you saw in the mirror, and that's what James 1, 23 is talking about. 
You look into the perfect law of God. He's saying, here is the standard. And I want you to realize where you stand so that there can be correction. So the first thing when you read the book of James, we have to do is be humble enough to just take our lumps. You ever had someone correct you and you're just like, uh-uh, and you get defensive right away. And then a month later you're like, okay, they were right. What James is doing is he's speaking and when we are confronted by things, what we're prone to do is to say, no, that's not me or that's somebody else and so on and so forth. And so my first request is that we look in the mirror, the perfect law of God, and we realize that maybe there are some things that are off and things that need shored up because when we're willing to do that, we're willing to ask for help. We're willing to go and, uh, and seek out something better. And I think God has good intentions for our speech. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is actually to give an illustration of somebody else. I could very much, very easily give this illustration of my own life as well. But I've been listening to a podcast series called The Rise and, Hill, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Anyone know what Mars Hill is? Heard of that before? Mars Hill is a, a massive church that started in, uh, um, nor- in the northwest of the states, Portland and into Seattle and so on, mostly Seattle, um, by Mark Driscoll. Who's heard that name before? Mark Driscoll? Um, Mark Driscoll had uh, a massive church. Like, it grew and grew and grew. He started this church. And this documentary tracks both the, the rise, obviously, and fall of Mars Hill. The fall was meteoric. It went quick. If you've ever heard Mark Driscoll preach, he's brash, he's almost rude, he's aggressive, he's angry very often. Um, there's times where his speech, is he swears from the pulpit. There's things that just like don't make sense at all. And you see in the things that he said and the way that he led that his character didn't meet, match up with his ability. And so what came out in his speech was an indicator of where that guy was actually likely at. A lot of people liked his preaching because he talked about things that no one was talking about in a way that no one was talking about them. And so people were attracted to that. But in this documentary, there's a lot of people that had regrets. And they regretted not confronting certain things, or they regretted being a part of this as it went. And they should have seen the signs. That was something that was common. They should have seen the signs. And one of those great indicators is speech. The reason I bring up Mark Driscoll, um, and I would lump myself in not on the same level as Mark Driscoll, maybe just as far as the influence goes, um, but the warning is from the first two verses. Let's get a warning here because... This is, it's very easy for you to point your finger at me, but just remember that all of us in some way are teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. How many of you just went, whew, am I ever glad I'm not a teacher? Yeah? Well, tough beans because all of you are in some way. All of you have influence in some way. Every single one of you has Influence. Maybe you coach. Maybe you're a mom or a dad. Eh, you ever thought of that? But all of us are actually called to be teachers in the sense that in the Great Commission, Jesus commissions his disciples, all disciples should go out and to baptize and to tell people about Jesus. And then it says in 28, 18 to 20, it will say these little words, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded them to do. Well, how do we do that? By instruction, but also by example. So you are an example and a teacher to those people who look to you as an example or as the picture of what they think maybe a Christian should be or what a good leader should be or what a coach should be. Maybe it's implied on you or maybe it's a position that you actually hold. All of us are teachers in some way. There's somebody that's looking at you, something looking to you as an example for them or as a leader for them. And so all of us are teachers, so don't neglect that. But the the real key is in the end of verse 1 and now into verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's perfect, able also to bridle his own body. Now, there's I think there's two ways to look at this. I think the first could be that James is being a little bit satirical here. He's saying, if you can control your tongue, you're perfect. And it's just all of us, everyone's just like, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't happen. There's part of that, but part of it is saying that if your tongue is in control, then you're also likely able to control your actions. 
Remember Joseph, the story of Joseph's brothers? Remember how when they were angry and bitter with Joseph in, his, in their heart, they were jealous of him and, and all that, but then it played out and it said that they could speak no kind word. So their, the feelings in their heart came out in their speech, and then their speech then led to, let's kill him. And so speech was the first indicator, and so if we can handle the first indicator, if there's things that are going right in, the, in our speech, that means likely we're going to act and behave appropriately as well. In the first two verses, what we have is, uh, the plain as I can put it, every person is going to be held accountable for, the, for your speech. Is that terrifying? To anybody? Nobody's going to weigh in. No one wants to say a word right now. <laughs> it's scary. Well, why would teachers be held to a higher account? That's the question we have to ask. The more your, your influence increases, the more influence your words have, right? So if I am leading one or two people, if I have three kids, or if I have uh, 30 people in a congregation, or 300 people, or 3,000 people, and I just speak flippantly, or I teach them the wrong thing, it impacts the lives of many other people. This is why Jesus is so harsh with the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law because their influence was magnified. People looked to them at, for instruction in the Word and they were teaching things that were not quite the law of God. And so my responsibility to stand in the pulpit is heavy. I hope you get that. When I stand up here, if I was to tell you something that is heretical and you start believing the wrong thing, that has implications not just for your life, but also for my eternity. I'm gonna, so I've heard one preacher say, if you get to heaven and you're standing in a line of preachers and teachers, get in another line. You don't want to be in that line. That's going to be the harsh judgment. And that is a weighty thing for us, but I think that weight is meant to sit on us as we read the rest of this passage. We are held to accountable for what we say because what we say has influence on other people. It impacts the lives of other people. And so I'm going to say that this is true um, as, as we keep going here. Let's go to verse 3. One of the episodes in the rise and fall of Mars Hill is, is an episode called I Kissed Christianity Goodbye. And the reason they titled it that was because so many people that came through Mars Hill shipwrecked their faith after Mars Hill started to fall. They actually have abandoned their faith as well. It was, a, it was something that came about. It was a phenomenon that was a part, of, uh, a part of the Mars Hill ministry. Now, many people's lives were impacted for the good. Uh, don't, don't take this the wrong way. But along the way, there was, uh, there was a lot of shipwreck as well. Now, he says in verse 2, How many of you are perfect? All of us are going to screw up, correct? Yeah? Can we acknowledge that? Yeah? I think a lot of us could read it in two ways. We could say, oh, good. Everyone's messed up. So it's an excuse to just keep being messed up. And I think we're going to look at this, and that's not going to be the case. What he's saying is, is that none of us can quite measure up, and we're prone to keep making mistakes, so be on your guard. Be careful. So take your role seriously. If you know that you're going to mess up, may that be sobering. So when I stand in the pulpit, that should sober me to the point where I make sure that I prepare well. If I just think, ah, whatever, it's not that big of a deal if I just get up and spout off here, it is a big deal. If we are prone to messing up, let's shore up the things so I don't do that. Okay? So this is, you're maybe thinking, well, I'm not leading a Bible study, I'm not doing this thing, but think about your parenting. How do you prepare to parent? Oh, man, that's a tough one, isn't it? How do I prepare to talk to my coworkers, or how do I prepare to coach properly, prepare my attitude? We're going to get to that in a second. Let's go to verse 3. So that's the first one. We're all going to be held, to, held accountable for our speech. Now we're going to get a little bit of a fruit inspection. I'm going to ask you questions as we break these things down. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. Look at the ships who, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds they are guided by a very small rudder whatever the will or wherever the will of the pilot decides so also the tongue is a small member yet it boasts of great things okay so let's just 
Look really carefully at verse 5, quickly. Again, this is one that's, that's hard to translate. This passage in James is one of the most nuanced type things. There's little phrases in here that the Greek could translate in one way or the other way, and I think that's actually intentional. It's so that we're taking it not just one way. And the first way you could take this is that it's prideful. It's arrogant. Anyone heard someone talk that's a little bit arrogant? Yeah, we've all been there. We boasted. The second way of doing this, uh, looking at it, could be also that the tongue is able to accomplish incredible things. So a, a vibrant speaker can motivate can drive somebody forward, can influence, can, can accomplish incredible things, correct? And anyone heard a speaker like that? God has gifted people to be able to speak that actually transforms lives and sets directions for companies and organizations and sets the, the tone for certain things. Now when the Spirit gets a hold of that, that influence is incredible. You look at the Billy Graham Crusades or things like that. People coming to faith by the thousands. Now, that's the move of the Spirit. I recognize that. But it took the words of an individual who got up there and preached um, and did incredible things. So it it boasts um, in a sense that it it accomplishes a, a massive amount. Here's the list of accomplishments that have happened through speech. Now, some of those things are mighty and good, and some of those things are mighty and evil. There are leaders that have been able to influence whole nations and drive the whole nation into rebellion and into fighting and into conquest and different things. A charismatic and dynamic speaker can manipulate and drive the direction um, in a negative way just as easily. So then we're given this example, two examples, the horse and the ship, both big things directed by something very little. And the reason for that is I want to say that your life This is the first way to read it. Your life, the direction of your life can be impacted by one word, can it? You go up to your boss and tell your boss off, how is your, how is the direction of your life going to change? Correct? You tell your wife off. Or you continue to make snide remarks. It's the same little thing, the dig that you get in there. It's going to change the course of your life. Your words can impact your own life, but your words can also set the course of a whole group of people. Your words you speak as a coach. Your words you speak as a parent. Your words you speak at, at work or, or wherever else you, you have influence can set the course of other people's life as, all, as well. So maybe this is the first instance that we need to look into the mirror. Have, has the direction of my life or the lives of other people around me been altered by the words that I've said? You know if you said something and you're sitting next to your spouse and you're going to have to deal with it later. It was something you said this morning. It's something that you said and you know you're going back to work to a a firestorm at work because of something that you said um, or maybe a a situation that you didn't handle properly. Uh, Been there. Words that you said in anger or frustration. And, uh, And so the direction of your life, the course of your life is evidence of, uh, of your speech. And so examine that. Second one, let's keep going, verse 6. Um, down in verse, or the end of verse 5, sorry. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set uh, um, among our members, st- standing, or sorry, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. Um, and set on fire by hell. Wow, that is a, uh, yeah, that is a, a striking thing. The end of verse 5 is going to go from the horse and the ship to a spark. What does the landscape of your life look like? It says, let's, let's say a spark falls in the right tinder and it just comes to blaze and all of a sudden you have a forest fire. Remember, we, we smelled the smoke all summer of the forest fires, correct? They burn and burn and burn. They're hard to put out. Um, and so the idea is of, of scorched earth. And see what little, little word can set the whole forest on fire. So let me ask you a second question, just as we talk about this a little bit. What does the landscape of your life look like? Are you constantly in controversy and conflict? Everywhere you go. 
Because I promise you that if everywhere you go there's conflict and controversy, everybody else likely isn't the problem. There's a common denominator. And it's likely your speech. It's likely the things that you say or the attitude that you bring into it. And so God is going to say, blessed are the peacemakers. And so he, in contrast to that, he says, what is the landscape of your life? Is it just scorched earth everywhere you go? And that might be a good indicator that there's something wrong in your speech. Now I want to touch on one little phrase here because I think it's telling. The end of verse 6, it says, the, whole, the tongue is set on fire by hell. Who has hell? Who has another word? Gehenna. There's two words for hell. Um, Jesus, outside of Jesus speaking, this is the only other time that Gehenna is used. Every other time it's, it's Hades, the place of the dead. Gehenna is a specific location in Jerusalem um, that was, just to sum it up, was a place where they used to offer child sacrifices. So they, they, when the nation of Israel started to worship other gods, the god Molech, and all the pagan nations that came in there, they offered child sacrifices in this place, um, the Valley of Henna, or the, the Sons of Henna, the Valley of the Sons of Henna. And they used to offer their children there. And it was so detestable to the Israelites later because of all the judgment that it brought and, and the practice was just disgusting um, that they turned it into a garbage dump. And so they would dump all the garbage of Jerusalem in this valley of the sons of Hena. And what they would do is they would pile it all up and burn it. And the fire would burn and burn and burn. So that's why you get pictures of hell and Jesus talks about it. It is the place where the fire never goes out. The worm never dies. The smell and the stench rises. All those pictures that we have of hell are a picture of a garbage dump. So take that picture now, and we look at the tongue. The whole tongue is set on fire by the garbage dump. Is the words that you speak indicators of the garbage that's in your life? Is it, is it, is it the smell of garbage? What's coming out of our mouth? That's a harsh thing to say, isn't it? It's set on fire by the garbage dump. Now, this would have been a vibrant, uh, incredible picture for any Jewish person. They would have understood what he was getting at. How many people have smelled the garbage dump? Yeah? They don't burn dumps very much anymore. There was a guy in the one community we lived in. He, would all, he was an older gentleman. He loved to burn stuff. And so he would just go and light the garbage dump. They were trying to stop all that for environmental purposes, but he'd always say, oh, lightning struck it. But he, yeah, <laughs> and so he would just go and burn this thing. I think he just liked fire. And uh, he would burn the garbage dump, and it would just reek. It would smell. It would blow over the whole town. And that's the idea. So remember the forest fire set on fire by the garbage that was in somebody that fueled their speech. So we have to be careful. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. Let's keep going, verse 7. Every kind of beast and bird, uh, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I want you to underline verse 8 because we're going to need to know this. Can you tame your tongue? What does the Bible say here? No man can tame your tongue. You got it. So for me to stand up and tell you, here's 15 things I want you to do and you'll get your tongue under control. Is that true? No. No. That would, that would crush you. It would crush me. It's not saying, it's not an excuse, well, I can't do it, so I'm not going to try. What it's saying is that this is a miraculous, spirit-filled work that has to happen. You can't do it by being super disciplined. It won't happen. This is a, a miraculous transformation that happens from the inside that then will impact your speech. No man can tame your tongue. Uh, this is the work of God. Now, he gives the examples. You see that guy with the donkey? He's leading that donkey along? Yeah, no, that, he's tamed that donkey. Or that dog over there? Uh, we can't tame a cat. I don't know why. Not all animals have been tamed. Cats are just, anyway, we, we don't need to go there. Um, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in his likeness. Man, you ever felt like a hypocrite? You've obviously never preached. You stand up here and talk about something like speech and I'll probably get in the van and yell at my kids for being ornery and, and stubborn. 
Anyone felt like that? You get to church yelling at your kids and then you walk in with a big smile and everyone's pretty and the dresses are fluffed and everything's good. This is saying this, if, if you feel like a hypocrite, it's a good indicator that let's, let's, let's get to the root. Don't just put a band-aid on, band on something that, that seems messy. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. Our last two verses here um, is where we're going to just spend the, the last bit of our time. Does a spring pour forth, uh, sorry, yeah, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? And can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So what, what James is saying is actually the exact words of Jesus. He's saying the problem is not your speech. The problem is your heart. So we've got to get to the fruit problem. Remember we go, fruit, we look at the fruit of our lives. Is there hypocrisy? Is there scorched earth? Is, is the direction of my life been impacted both maybe negatively, maybe positively? There's, there's good and bad. Don't just beat yourself up. But at the same time, the evidence that's there maybe indicates something that's going on inside. I've spoken out of bitterness and frustration and anger so many times, and it's just it, it's an indicator of what's going on inside. The speech is just one part. And thankfully, God has built this in as a gracious warning sign before we act out on that. We speak, and we're like, oh man, I can't believe I did that. If we didn't speak first, and we just went out and bopped somebody, that's the first inclination of your heart, boy, there, there, it, we'd be in even rougher shape. Most of us would be in prison, right? And so it's important that we recognize that this is actually God being very gracious. That He wants to show us that the evidence of your mouth is an indicator of the heart. Stop. Pause. Do something about the heart so that we don't go any further. And so he says, let's get to the root. Find the source of the Nile, if you will. Find the source of the spring and let's, let's get this. Because it can't produce both fresh and salt water. Let's go to Matthew. I'm going to close off with a list of scriptures here. Just to, that give us some insight into what do we do? What do we do then? If there's nothing I can do, should I do nothing? No. Um, God has given us some great insights. This is where we need to come back to the gospel to impact the root. Verse 33, Matthew 12, verse 33. <laughs> Agreed. Everyone wants to go home. I hear you. I get it. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Amen? But here's an interesting part. He's saying, make the tree good. There's practical things that we can be doing. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? By who they are is what they are speaking. So it, it starts with who they are in their identity. And Jesus is going to talk about if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So we need to start living in that identity, in light of that identity of who we actually are. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. So what do we need to bring into us? What, what needs to be in us? Good what? Good treasure. Now I want to ask you, what, because as you keep reading, there is an evil person out of the evil treasure. What is an evil treasure? We don't think of treasure that way, do we? Now, this, this is a weird thing, but he's saying there are things that seem really valuable and good and precious to us that we bring into our life that are actually a bad influence, that we treasure as our possessions, as this is just who I am. This is something that makes me, whatever it might be, but this, this treasure, we have to be sure that the treasure that we have within us is good, Good treasure. So we need, to, we need to, I think, we need to worship. It's a really good way to treasure in our hearts who we're serving, what we've been given, who, who, what the God is like that we claim to know and follow and be in relationship with. 
The treasure that is in our heart that we store up, that we rest in, that we, uh, that we value. So what is it that you're clinging to and valuing most? Um, is it your influence? Because sometimes if it's your influence that you're clinging to, then you fight and battle and you're willing to bop anybody that gets in your way of that influence. And so we make, need to make sure that the good treasure that is in us is producing the good. And that we need to make sure that the treasure that is in us is good. How do we know that? We're going to come back to another passage in a second. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account, and we've read that already, give an account for every careless word that they speak. For by your works you will be justified. Your words, I'm sorry. By your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. How is it that we can be justified by our words, or declared right, made righteous, um, well, I think partially, if I can take you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. I'm going to say confession is actually the first thing that we need to focus on. And maybe what James is getting at. Acknowledge that all of us mess up. Acknowledge that none of us contain the tongue is the first indicator that you're humble enough to accept you're not a perfect person. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When you read the Beatitudes, it's all about this recognition that we are needy individuals, correct? So the first thing we need to do is, is confess our weakness and our frailty. Uh, that is actually the first portion of the gospel too. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You a sinner? No one's going to answer that? You a sinner? Yeah, I am. I'm thankful though that God has, has granted me grace and mercy and forgiveness. So if we confess with our mouth Romans 10, 9, and 10, and then we go over to um, maybe let's go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. What does that one say? It's even up there. If we confess our sins, he is. Uh, is it that miserable of a passage? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all... Oh, we need that cleansing. So there's two parts. Forgiveness and cleansing. Do you ever, do you ever see the two parts before? We often think of that verse in, in lieu of salvation. If I confess my sins, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me so I can be a Christian. Good. But there's a second part. Cleansing. We need this purifying nature. That is the good water that's going to come out. We need clean water to come out. We need to confess our sin over and over. The verse before it and the verses that are going to come after it. For if you say you have no sin, you're a liar and you make God out to be a liar. So don't do it. Acknowledge your weakness because this is the starting point of forgiveness and cleansing. It's the starting point of our salvation. It's the starting point of every Christian endeavor is acknowledging that we are weak and yet God is faithful and he is good and he is strong. Now let's, let's carry on here just a little bit. Um, now let's go to the book of James down to verse 5, verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another. I have a weakness. Maybe you do too. And pray for one another. Sometimes we need the support, the accountability of other people. James is going to make that very clear as well. James five sixteen. Now let's go to Romans chapter 8. Will you? Romans chapter 8. Here's another thing that we need to start doing. The contrast in Romans 6 and 7 is life according to trying to keep the law and it crushes. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, oh man, I know the good I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it. I try really hard. I just, I keep failing. Who can save me from this life of sin? And then he says, but thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord who has saved me. Amen? It, it is not in you to be good enough. It's not in you to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We need to acknowledge the fact that we are weak. And then we need to live according to the Spirit. We don't live according to the old way. Verse 3. 8 verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh of who I actually am, could not do. So no man can tame his tongue, but the Spirit can. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for, died for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but
but according to the Spirit. Now you will also see, and I'll take you here, let's go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23 quickly. <clears throat> 5.22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let's, let's put a few of those up against speech. What about self-control? Have you ever needed self-control with your speech? You ever needed to be loving in your speech? Or patient in your speech? You need to be joyful in your speech sometimes? Oh man, I get frustrated and down miserable. Had one of those days yesterday. Sometimes we just need that kick in the pants that we need to stop walking according to what we, what we naturally are. We need to n admit our weakness and cry out for help and a dose of the Spirit to help us through that situation. And this is the gift that God has given us by His Spirit. Well, how do we do that as well? How does this become transformative? There's two passages that go together, and I want you to write them down. In Ephesians 5.18, Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. As you teach and admonish one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and it goes on. And then it talks about all this list of things. How we talk to each other, how we speak to each other, how we sing our songs. And then it goes to marriage, and then it goes to children, and then it's going to go to how do we relate to the rest of the church. The same, that happens in the book of Ephesians. Parallel passage is Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then it's going to then it's gonna continue on and talk about marriage, and then it's going to talk about kids. You see, the parallel passages are that if you want to be filled with the Spirit, you need to be people of the Word. We need to know what is at the heart of God. Our worship needs to be fueled by the good things that are that are coming into the good treasure, what we're taking into our life? Or are we so filled with a garbage dump that that just naturally comes out? Let me take you back to the book of James. The next passage, what we're going to talk about next week, um, really gets at this. James chapter 3, and the next one, we're going to talk about wisdom, godly wisdom, and, uh, and I guess bad wisdom as well, starting in verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes from us. So it talks, let's start reading 14. But if you have bitter jealousy... Selfish ambition in your heart. Don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Think of that in lieu of speech. So, is your speech fueled by the garbage dump? Or is your speech being fueled by the wisdom that is from above, which comes to us through the good and perfect Word of God? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Paul tells the Romans in chapter 12. And he says, be transformed by the renewing of the mind. That It starts there. And then it goes to the heart. Then it comes from our speech. Then it goes to our actions. But it starts with the heart. So we have a monumental task to be humble enough to accept. Realizing that we can't do it. This is a miraculous, ongoing work of the Lord. Many of us probably have stories of how our lives have been influenced by the, the words of somebody else. That encouraging word, just the right time. Anyone got one of those? Maybe you were really little and it was just your dad saying, good job. You ever thought of how influential just that, that little word is or I love you at just the right time? Our words have massive influence on the lives of other people. You know it from your own experience. And so we need to be sure that we're guarding those things, guarding those things well um, and asking that the Spirit would use us and speak through us to bring a harvest of righteousness, it says in verse 17, or verse 18. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace. That's what we want. We want good things to be produced through our words. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask now for your grace to be upon us as we go from this place. Lord, uh, you've also told us in the first chapter to be 
slow to speak, slow to become angry, quick to listen. It's hard for us to do, God, because the natural man just uh, seems to just war within us over and over again. Lord, we're prone to discouragement and frustration and anger and jealousy and bitterness. Lord, uh, just help us in, in those moments to confess that, to recognize it for what it is, to acknowledge our weakness. And Father, would you continue to intercede for us, uh, just like you promised in 1 John 2. When we do mess up, Father, we thank you that we have an advocate with the Father. We have Christ. I thank you for that substitute, but I also thank you for filling us with your Spirit to produce in us things that we can't produce on our own. We ask for a fresh anointing of your Spirit to go and to speak your words, to love other people, to encourage and maybe to rebuke at times, but to do so in a loving and gracious way, to correct in a way that is honorable to you and to teach in a way that points people to you and not away from you. Just ask, God, that you would guard our hearts. Father, I would just echo one more time the words of the psalmist. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.